Jenna Rufo here, and I am so pleased today to introduce you to a former classmate and colleague of mine, Jonathan Alderson. Jonathan specializes in working with children with autism and currently runs a consulting business out of Southwestern Ontario. Jonathan's completion of a three-year intensive certification training at the Autism Treatment Center of America strongly influenced his current focus on a humanistic approach to autism treatment. Jonathan has worked in the Sunrise Program in Massachusetts as an administrator and a senior family trainer. He additionally has spent time in London, where he supported families from the United Kingdom, Ireland, Holland, and Spain. Jonathan has instructed more than 3,000 families and students with disabilities around the world. Jonathan has developed an integrated model to support students with autism called the Intensive Multi-Treatment Intervention. This holistic approach views the child with autism as an individual first and does not subscribe to a one-size-fits-all model. Jonathan has shared his knowledge of autism at numerous training events and seminars. He is also author of the book, Challenging the Myths of Autism, where he advocates for rethinking how we traditionally conceive autism. All right, hi everyone. I am excited to be here today uh, with my colleague, Jonathan Alderson. And Jonathan and I reconnected after almost 20 years, I think, Jonathan, uh, yeah. when we were students and classmates together at Harvard University Graduate School of Education. And the reason that I reached out to Jonathan is because I really appreciated and valued his approach to working with students with autism. Uh, and Jonathan has a really humanistic approach and really looking at students individually and trying to develop those positive relationships. So I'm really excited about our talk today. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, and it has been really wonderful to reconnect with you. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to a conversation. We had a lovely one uh, a couple of weeks ago. We just seemed to share a lot of um, ideas together. Um, and also, I think it's good to challenge each other as well to, to yeah. continue to grow and open up. Yeah, absolutely. So Jonathan, I had mentioned that I really value your approach to working with kids with autism in that um, while you certainly use principles of behavior modification and things like that, you really approach it from a relational standpoint and working with them in a humanistic way. So maybe you could just start out by telling us a little bit about your approach. Yeah. Um, so on uh, first, for, first of all, um, I had begun my journey uh, after undergrad in, in developmental psychology, went uh, to a place in Massachusetts, um, an autism treatment center where I did about four years of training. And while I was there, uh, I learned deeply about connecting with uh, children and the parents as a form of therapeutic, what we call the therapeutic alliance, essentially. Um, you could think about it as an educator alliance, but there's so much research that tells us about the importance of having a good relationship with your student. I mean, it's, it sounds so obvious. It sounds so obvious. And yet there's not always um, a focus on the relationship to, to the student. We often as teachers, educators, and even parents, I think we focus on the curriculum or the goal, you know, whether it's a behavioral goal, like I have to get my child to brush his teeth. But in that, in that ambition, um, it may be an uncomfortable relationship as I try and, you know, struggle to get that toothbrush in my child's mouth. So what I teach parents, for example, and, and teachers is if we pause for a moment and before we think about the goal of brushing your teeth or teaching mathematics, could we think about how I'm interacting with this student or my child? And not only think about that, but there could be skills that can be acquired that a teacher could learn, an educator could learn, a therapist, a behavior therapist, a speech therapist could learn, parents, even though with your own, your very own child, that there are skills and techniques that you could learn of how to build a rapport that within which a child feels that they trust you, that they're excited to learn from you, they're motivated to learn, they're receptive. We talk about receptivity. So that's really where I began that journey and learning about that over the next 20 years, got to, um, had a, the opportunity to practice with, with hundreds of different children and families and situations and schools and saw over 
and over and over and over again that when a teacher sits down and says, hey, I've got this student, really, I care for the student, I want so much for the student, but it's such a struggle, the behavioral issues, what can I do about him, you know, calling out in class, let's say. And instead of going to a behavioral strategy right away, we get there. First, we say, okay, can I just observe a little bit or could you tell me a little bit about how you relate to this job? What's the relationship dynamic? And 100% of the time, there's something that, that we could teach that teacher, a tip or strategy around relating that can often resolve most, if not all, of the behavioral problems. So we don't have to get into reinforcements and punishments and that kind of stuff. Right. And like you said, I think it seems so obvious that, um, sure, of course, we need a good relationship with students. But in your book, so Jonathan's an author, and I have his book right here, um, Challenging the Myths of Autism. So one of the things that you noted in the book was that this myth that um, students with autism don't display affection. So I wonder, and you know, maybe in your experience, do you feel like that's a barrier sometimes when we're working with kids because we have these ideas of you know, what they may or may not be able to do or the relationships that they might be able to form? Absolutely, uh, uh, 100%. And, and I think, Jen, in, in your work in schools and classrooms as well, I'm sure you uh, come up against what I call myths, what you might, we might call stereotypes, negative stereotypes, right? About different students, students with Down syndrome, uh, students with different kinds of learning challenges or learning differences. And certainly with autism, uh, there are a whole number of commonly held beliefs um, about these children, about this population, about adults with autism as well. Beliefs that we get from the media, from movies like Rain Man and TV shows like The Good Doctor. And, and, and it's terrific. It's really, really good news that people with autism are being portrayed in the media more and more, but they're often portrayed with stereotypes. Right, absolutely. So I think too, like you had mentioned, really looking at a student from you know, not what we have these preconceived ideas of, okay, a student needs to act this way or behave a certain way in school, but really just taking a step back and saying, okay, what might really be at the root of this? And that's what I really love about your approach. Yeah, right, right on. So there's a, a little tagline that sticks in my mind, which is different, not defective, mm -hmm. um, or different, not defunct. Uh, and, um, you know, if you think about almost any relationship, really, Jenna, I mean, uh, for, the, for, the, for your viewers listening or watching, Think about a relationship in your life, maybe, maybe someone that's close, a spouse, um, could be a child. And if, if, they, if, uh, if, if they like something different than you or a different way, let's say you're having a barbecue and uh, they want ketchup on their hot dog and you want mustard, um, it wouldn't occur to you, I hope it wouldn't occur to you <laughs> that you say, Oh my, oh my word, we have to have a hot dog intervention here. Right. <laughs> um, you know, my husband wants mustard. Now, sometimes, sometimes we are surprised at what people like right. that's different from us. And we say, what? You like peanut butter on your hot dog? Kind of thing. <laughs> Um, I think there's a commercial I saw recently where a, a child is doing that and, and the mother says, well, where did you learn that? And, and the child sort of looks at the mom and says, you know, what? Don't you do that? In other words, it, 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 it was reversed. The child is sort of looking at the adult saying, don't you guys put peanut butter in your hot dog? It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a peanut butter commercial. But so sometimes we are surprised at differences, but you're right. We don't think my word, you know, you need to, we need to do a sort of a behavioral intervention or you need to take a course to learn how to enjoy ketchup on your hot dog. <laughs> when, when you have, I think adults tend to do that. First of all, to children more often, we do think, oh, you, you know, you don't like this or you don't like that. Well, well you need to. Right. We don't accept differences as much in children. But definitely with children with autism and especially nonverbal children with autism, mm -hmm. we tend to impose and superimpose our beliefs, our needs, our um, preferences on the child. I think largely because we can't ask them or we haven't figured out how to ask them. 
Um, and so in the absence, uh, you know, at a, at a barbecue, I could turn to, to my spouse or my friend and say, hey, the hot dogs are almost done. What would you like on it? Mm-hmm. And they can, they can tell me. And so uh, if I can't do that or I haven't figured out how to get that communication, have that communication with someone with autism is nonverbal, I'm going to assume what I like. So let's say I put ketchup on this child's hot dog, they might take it and then throw it away. And what I make up and conclude is, oh, you know, that's inappropriate behavior. He has to learn how to keep that hot dog uh, in on his plate or to, to, to put it in the garbage, not on the floor. Um, and, and it might not occur to me, you know, uh, he doesn't want ketchup on his hot dog. And right. Maybe my spouse might throw the hot dog at me too if I put <laughs> ketchup on it. So, so, so what do we do about that though? I think there's two things and, and, and that you're sort of alluding to. And, and one is be to learn, and this is a skill, to learn to step back from or pause our assumptions that we impose on people. And that's a skill. I think we can do it again with our spouses, with our neighbors, certainly with, with children um, who have different communication styles and needs. I think we have to step back or suspend our judgments, our beliefs, our opinions, um, and, and really invest in time to find out from the other person what it is that they like. And then the second thing, and that's a journey. Mm-hmm. The, the, the second, I think, skill is to open our minds up to the reality, the truth that people like different things. Some people like mustard and some people like ketchup and your child may want to be picked up and he may not want to be picked up right. and your daughter may want to color on paper and and she might not she want to she might want to color on cardboard boxes Mm -hmm. to be open to those differences is critical as an educator as a parent yeah absolutely and that kind of leads me into your take on what we have previously called self-stimulatory behaviors or stims Um, And as a former autistic support teacher myself, I know that there was always a lot of concern over, you know, flapping or spinning and all of that movement. So uh, if you could just share with us a little bit about how you've reframed looking at those behaviors and um, even some of the strategies that you have engaged in, like joining and imitating to support the growth of students. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jenna. In your in your work, what what is a repetitious behavior that you remember seeing, maybe in one of the students that you had to kind of deal with? Mm-hmm. I think um, I had one student who, when he was kind of jazzed up, would just run around the room, so kind of running in circles, and he needed that movement, proprioceptive input to get all that energy out. Hmm. Hmm. Wow, you know, I'm aware as you describe that, even the language you use is different from what we often hear. And it's more pro, I'm going to say, as opposed to anti repetitious mm-hmm. behavior. So you said when he gets jazzed up, so you're attributing um, a reason to it. Right. And if we just pause there, uh, back in the 19. 19- uh, 40s and 50s, there was a uh, very well-known professor emeritus at UCLA named Ivar Lovas, who was really the grandfather of bringing applied behavioral analysis, a science of behavior, to the field of autism and even to education more broadly. He's a very important figure in this. And he wrote some seminal papers that have influenced the field to this day. And one Um, set of papers and uh, view that he held was that repetitious ritualized behaviors um, don't serve a function, that they're non-functional. In fact, he would say that they're dysfunctional. Um, In other words, that they might get in the way of typical function. So if we just step back for a moment, um, one of the three uh, primary areas of diagnosis or key diagnostics for the diagnosis of autism one of them is repetitious and ritualized behaviors. And that's what we're talking about. So that could be a behavior that a child or adult with autism does over and over and over and over again for periods of time, maybe for five, 10 minutes, 
often throughout the day um, at different times. So it could be just rocking back and forth. Um, Jen, as you said, circuiting, going around in, in a circle. Um, I've worked with children who line objects up. So if you take them out to a restaurant, they might take your fork and dad's knife and the napkin holder and the salt shaker and the pepper shaker and the ketchup and then something else that they see and line them all up and it's not just that they do that once but that would be again a pattern that they might do in every restaurant that you ever go to over and over so how do you deal with that is the big question for educators and parents and um where we start in, in, in my approach, which comes back to the very first thing you said of a humanistic approach, um, is we, we start with our attitude. We start with what we believe. What's the belief we hold about, about that? And in your, in, in your description, you said, you know, this little guy was jazzed up and, and you, said, you said he needed to do it. He needed to burn off, you know. So again, you're attributing that. Um, and so your belief with that, if you as an educator believe that this child needs to do that for some reason that's beneficial to run off steam, then of course you might allow him to do it or find a way for him to do it that works in the classroom. If on the other hand, I'm uh, in the behavioral lovas camp, if you will, you know, and I'm believing that it's non-functional, doesn't serve a purpose, and is disruptive, then I'm going to move in ways to stop the child from running in a circle, right. believing that it's not helpful for him. So it's key not just to jump to what do we do, but the first question, set of questions that I um, use in working with educators and parents is not what do we do, but what do we think? Mm -hmm. What do we believe okay. about it? Because that determines what I do. So again, coming back to um, our attitude is a key, key piece. Stay tuned for part two of this episode, Challenging the Myths of Autism, where Jonathan and I discuss tips for including students with autism in general education and how to release our control as adults to support children with challenging behaviors. We will also share our new partnership to help schools engage in both student-centered planning and systems change. In the meantime, be sure to visit my website at www.jennarufo.com for information on my latest offerings, blogs, videos, and more.